for our panel. So in case you missed it at the beginning, this is a panel organized by the Kohler Fellows from the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. And we have four wonderful panelists who are sharing their time here from the University of Wisconsin. And just to get things rolling, thank you. Uh, we also have a few flyers, I should mention, being handed out by Open Doors for Refugees, who are an organization working on um, immigration and refugee issues here in Madison. Um, so just to get the ball rolling, I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves. So what I'd love is for each of you to take just a couple of minutes to let us know sort of who you are and maybe give us your initial reactions to the film. Hello, my name is uh, Sarah McKinnon and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication Arts and I do research on the experiences of refugees and immigrants, primarily in a U.S. context, although the European context is also an area that I've looked at doing qualitative research as well as archival research. Um, and in particular, looking at the experiences of people who are fleeing gender-based violence and sexuality-related violence. So I'm happy to talk about that a little bit as well. And in terms of my general reaction to the film, I think the film did a really nice job of showing just how exclusionary um, immigration policies, refugee policies can be. Um, I think as we saw at the end, three people out of 20 or 30 um, were going to be given a permanent residency in Netherlands. I think that's a really important context. So the rules, the categories, the elements that make it really difficult actually to receive refugee resettlement in a country um, in Europe as well as in the United States, uh, North America. Uh, and I think it's also important to contextualize where refugees are. So if we think about a country like Syria, there are five million people displaced from Syria today. Five million. And most of, most of them are not in Europe. Most of them are not in the United States. 2.5 are living in Lebanon, a million in Jordan, um, a half a million in countries surrounding. Um, those areas, and in fact, that's very much the case for refugee context. The, the primary place where refugees are located are in neighboring countries. 95% are in neighboring countries. And so we, if we think about uh, refugees per inhabitants, um, in Lebanon there are about 230 refugees per 1,000 inhabitants. The, the closest number we get in the European context is Sweden with 15 uh, re refugees per 1,000 inhabitants. Uh, something like France and Germany is about four per 1,000 inhabitants. In the United States, we are 0.8, I'm sorry, 0 0.08 refugees per 1,000 inhabitants. And so the, the, the rhetoric, the discourse that's about this burden, this flood, really I think it's important to contextualize in relation to the numbers. So I'll stop there. Hi, I'm Nora Stone. I'm a PhD student in film in the Department of Communication Arts, along with Sarah. Um, and I study uh, documentary film, especially the market for documentary films in the past 50 years. Um, and so I, I guess I, I kind of admired this film. I was a little anxious coming in because there's this um, really uh, provocative way of that it's structured with this actor um, confronting actual refugees that I think is um, a pretty daring and, and a, you know, a definitely provocative move that I think probably draws in a lot of audiences, but I really admire um, that it took this essayistic form um, going through the two sides of the, um, the two sides of the coin starting with this more um, conservative idea of uh, a response to refugees moving to the more um, left-wing liberal idea of the response to refugees and then going through what the actual process, uh, simulation of the process would be like, winnowing people down by these, um, by these uh, laws, these exclusionary laws, um, and showing, I think that the essay form does a really great job of showing just how um, regimented the process is of, uh, you know, accepting a few people, pushing the rest to the side, um, in a way that a, a film that really personalizes the refugee experience, um, lets us get to know characters, um, without really uh, learning about the system, um, wouldn't be able to do as well. So I, I admire it for that. I also admire it for um, pointing out 
at, at the end, you know, for the context that this movie is going to be seen in, mostly, you know, on television in the Netherlands and at film festivals, and, you know, just giving the budget. How many films will do that? We'll say, oh, yes, we got, you know, we'll say it in, as part of the whole context. We got this amount of money um, from, you know, the arts board in the Netherlands. I think that's a really interesting move, too. I'm just going to jump in for one second and say that the way that we're going to do questions today, just so that we can keep things moving, is we've actually got some of our fellows here who have papers and pencils, and rather than hand out the microphone, um, if you'd like to ask a question, just flag one of them down. We've got one on each side here, and um, they're going to ferry the questions down to me, just to keep things flowing. So, sorry to jump in. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Leslie Bartlett. I'm a professor in the Department of Educational Policy Studies in the School of Education at UW-Madison. It's nice to be here with you all this evening. I'm trained as an anthropologist, and I work in the field of comparative and international education. And so I do a good bit of work on <clears throat> issues related to immigration and education, including education in emergency settings uh, or in post-conflict settings, some of which would be um, represented in the life stories of, of the refugees here. And I'm also really interested in issues around language and literacy and have done work, for example, in uh, Kakuma refugee camp looking at educational quality and the provision of educational, uh, of, of education in settings like that. So. I had a lot of reactions to the film. I'm sure all of you did as well, and I'd really like to hear about that. A couple of things that struck me in addition to the things that have already been mentioned. Um, I am really interested in that, in that third segment in how much uh, asylum status depends on a language interview and the um, person being interviewed, what he or she understands about what's being asked, how much he or she, how well he or she speaks the language in which it's being asked. I was really struck by the, the interview with one of them. Uh, he was told that he uh, didn't express himself sufficiently, that he was vague, that it wasn't plausible. Uh, he was probably working in his third language in order to do that, right? So, and there has been some research doing uh, linguistic analyses of these um, interviews with asylum seekers in ways that I think are, are really interesting how, how the interviewer determines what's plausible, what's truthful, and those kinds of things. I, was, I thought the film did a really nice job of showing what we could really honestly call the extreme vetting of refugees that goes on and it would be interesting to see something similar here. I think it could be quite educational for the general public. And that leads me to my final point which is the film seems to suggest to us that we should all be uncomfortable sitting here in, in our comfy chairs uh, watching this as a form of entertainment. I didn't feel uncomfortable for that reason. I actually thought it was, I learned a lot from it. I think there's important work to do in educating American and European publics about immigration and about refugees. I did feel really uncomfortable ab about the interactions, the what I considered fairly dehumanizing interactions between the actor, who we, the person we learn is an actor, and the refugees themselves. Um, that it was very pedagogical in the worst possible sense of the word, the, um, the earliest act, and even the second act, I felt like both of those were a bit um, flat representations of a much more complex view on, on immigration and refugees. And even the last one where it's, it's still fairly dehumanizing, you know, putting a piece of tape on people and just sending them out and it was clear that some of them didn't even understand what was happening. And so um, I, I, there's a lot for us to talk about there that I think would be quite interesting, but it does certainly represent what going through that experience of vetting must feel like um, for some of the refugees. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Venkat Mani. I'm a um, professor here in the Department of German, Nordic and Slavic at UW-Madison. I, my work is on literatures of migration um, in the European context, specifically in the German context. I work on migration, on refugees. Um, I, uh, but I'm not just a professor, much like you, I'm also audience human being. Um, and that's sort of the second hat that um, I think I can present to you today. Um, I'm also a migrant, um, albeit a very fortunate migrant. Um, unlike the people who were interviewed for this particular film, um, I'm... Um, and I, I sort of my reaction to the film is very much filtered not just by what is my area of research. I teach migration, um, sort of the U.S. European um, comparative aspects of migration, beyond demographics, beyond statistics. What happens with movies? What happens with films? Uh, or what happens with with novels and short stories? How do we give? that human face, that human voice to uh, stories of migration beyond statistics. Um, but I think in this particular case, statistics in, in, in the film, the statistics becomes important. Um, and here comes my reaction to the film. I'm very happy that Sarah started with talking about statistics. Um, because at the end of the film, I thought 180,000 euros were spent on this. Um, this is, and, and here comes my reaction, if you start with the prologue um, of the film where this movement, this en masse movement of, of, northern, of, of southerners um, to the north, the north, the unidentified north, and, and later we learn it's northern Europe is shown. Um, from the very beginning, the film sets the tone that anybody who's a migrant, who's a refugee, happens to be a person of color, comes from the south, has only moved from the south to the north, and in that northern migration, what was lacking to me, and I say that as a migrant to the United States, I did move from the south. My, my country, to use the vocabulary from the film, it's a safe country of origin, so to say, <laughs> right? So I'm not a danger to anybody um, or to myself. Um, but, uh, but it was funny for me to see that the entire history of movements of people from Europe to the United States did not find one second of footage in this particular film. If I missed it completely, I might be mistaken, but if anybody noticed it, help me understand that. Um, there were waves of migration from 19th century, and I work on, on German migration, not just contemporary migration, post-war migration into Germany, but the longer history of migration out of Germany into the United States, which, you know, I'm sitting in the right state for it. This is Wisconsin. Um, and to, to forget that history, to forget about the local histories of migration, um, that seemed to me rather problematic. And the film just, th this film to me ultimately is a great, nice, noblesse oblige, actor or not, um, a privileged individual's view of how migration should be, should be viewed. Um, the film also only interviews from what I saw, most of the people were uh, refugees. There was a huge class difference, there was a huge educational difference between people who were being interviewed and the, the actor himself. Um, and that, I'm just saying, because there are 21 billion international migrants in the world today. 21 billion, that is according to UNHCR, this is United Nations statistics, out of which 26 million, 2016 set a new record in terms of refugees and migrants. But there are willful migrants, people who are fortunate enough to actually, you know, go get work permits, na education, naturalize, and then there are people who are interviewed in this film. So the film did not distinguish between that. Right? These are asylum seekers, these are refugees. They have very particular stories. It's a very different kind of a narrative. And to just call them migrants, that was very problematic for me. So I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Um, I'm, oops. Um, actually, I'd love to open it up for the panel if you have questions for each other. I'm, I'm gonna note that I, in fact, I'm also Australian, so I moved from south to north, but Australia could be considered the north in the terms of this 
film and just exposes yet again sort of lacking of vocabulary and depth in that examination. But do the panelists have any questions for each other? Would you like to expand on I just want to comments? note that I'm from North Carolina, so I'm also moving from South to North. But it's a different sound. <laughs> I'm from Virginia. So, so oh, okay. <laughs> I'm in August company, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so to, to speak to, um, I agree, yeah, I think the term migrants, um, I, I'm not sure about what the, a better term would be, but I absolutely agree that this is about a very specific type of migrant, even a very, um, maybe a stereotypical migrant or, or what is right now the migrant that is holding people's attention, that is, that is um, getting so much play by the right wing, especially in Europe. Um, and yeah, I agree that, the, that there is a lacking of United States context, but I think that the, the point of this being made for Dutch television kind of makes that point you know of course there are micro histories of migration um, and there are lots and lots of other um, class differences between um, people who move from all other parts of the world for education or work um, but I think yeah this this could have been we would have liked to have it be more precise but yeah yeah so I think the point about the category of migrant is extremely important here because one of the methods of exclusion, one of the methods of creating um, you count, you don't count, is, exact, is precisely the category. So who gets to be included and recognized as a refugee? Um, in the middle of that interview, you heard the, the actor asking, did you leave political violence? Do you have particular political opinions that uh, might make you um, dangerous to a state? And, and, and what he was doing there was using the definition of a refugee to try to figure out whether or not that person fit in the category of refugee. So a refugee is someone outside, of, according to the United Nations, a refugee is someone outside of um, their country with a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a social group. So to be recognized as a refugee and uh, have access to the sorts of um, uh, benefits, the very basic benefits that that might allow you, you have to be able to fit into those categories. If you don't, you're economic migrant, right? And so those categories really, really matter in terms of who's able to gain not only not only entrance to Europe or to the United States, but just basic needs right after fleeing a persecution. Um, and so the notion of, of what those categories are and how they're defined then become a means to, to uh, filter people in or filter people out. I was just going to say that for me it wasn't about micro histories or anything and, and thank you for adding that um, you know the, the categorization of people there are three kinds of actually refugees uh, before you become a registered refugee the UNHCR also distinguishes you as a forcibly displaced person or a stateless person. So there are different kinds, even within those asylum seekers, there are different kinds of categories. And those are the kind of histories that then filter into what um, national policies, immigration policies, who is accepted, who is not. Second context that I want to point out is the Netherlands actually has a dismal record right now of actually giving refuge to people. So this is very much sort of, if you, if you contrast this film with statements of Gerd Wilders, maybe the Dutch need to watch this film. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't. Um, but but I, what I want to also point out is um, only 6% of the total number of asylum seekers or refugees around the world, only 6% are right now in Europe. Okay, out of that, 4% are being absorbed in Germany. The rest, 2%, are being absorbed in the rest of the affluent Western nations. So I don't know what this entire big, just talking about perspective, what is this, this big drama about sort of this refugee crisis when the top five 
nations, as you point out, pointed out earlier, they're neighboring countries, which means it's, it's Jordan, Pakistan, yeah. Turkey, um, and others. So, I mean, those 39%, I mean, just to give you a perspective, 39% of refugees are right now being absorbed in Asian countries, not in Europe. So, um, and the United States is even, even lower, but only 6% in Europe, let's remember that. Questions? Um, we have about five minutes left, so I'm, the question I'd like to ask the panel is, how do these sorts of issues apply here in Wisconsin? So we heard some talk about um, the history of German migration here to Wisconsin. In fact, the film talked about um, the man's father's experience during World War II and um, some opinions of presumably stereotypical Europeans about that sort of migration. I wonder if any of you have any commentary to make about the context here in Wisconsin. I can talk briefly about that. So there, in terms of refugee resettlement in the United States, first of all, the United States is very different than the European context for refugees. So uh, in the US, we have two forms of, of becoming a refugee. There's refugee resettlement and there's asylum. Um, and in, a, in the Wisconsin context, most of the time we're talking about a refugee resettlement. So groups from, uh, from Kenya who have who been in Kakuma uh, refugee camp were flagged by the United Nations as needing um, a, a third country to resettle in uh, then are given entrance. It's a very small percentage of people that are ever, ever, um, ever able to come to the United States. But in Wisconsin, we do have groups of refugees, about 70,000 in total, mostly Hmong communities. Um, and that's been a migration that's happened for a long time. And I think this, this film articulates really interestingly with some of the controversy, some of the, the consternation, the rhetoric around Syrian refugees. So in 2015, um, Governor Walker said, we will not admit Syrian refugees into Wisconsin. We will not allow that to happen. So you really see this kind of nativistic, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee rhetoric playing out. That's not something that he could do, right? So refugee resettlement is something that happens through the federal government. But you see, you see that sort of, no, we will not admit refugees. Um, and so in, in large part, I think the rhetoric around refugees is burden. It's we mistrust these communities. It's, um, it's various things like drain on the state. And so there's a sort of negative overall view of, of how refugees are received in communities that I think is not just Wisconsin specific, it's US specific, but it articulates here as well. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that struck me about the film was the discussion of even those, those that, that tiny minority that is admitted to the Netherlands, what their, what their possibilities are like, the short term of the, um, permission to stay in the country, the high unemployment rates, and those sorts of things. And so one of the things that struck me about the film was <clears throat> we're, we're in a period right now where we're having a lot of discussion and debate about who can even get in, right? But there's not enough focus on what happens once people are in, whether they're refugee, immigrant, or, or other category. And so I'm really interested in questions of what kind of social policies do we have to support immigrants, what kind of, does the label refugee afford, what, what does it afford and what does it not really give in terms of support that people need in order to, to resettle? The fact is most refugees are resettled into poverty, quite extreme poverty, and they're expected to learn English in maybe three months and then find work. And whether you learn English or not really is irrelevant. You need to find work and be able to support your family. Um, I'm also really interested in, in Wisconsin, one of the things we're really struggling with is the lack of any, any meaningful bilingual education for immigrant and refugee families. And so that, that tiny glimpse the film gave us into what even the lucky ones who do get resettled, what they might face, I think is something for us to think about here at home. And I personally think none of us in this room, I mean, if one started, this is, 
a lesson that you know I learn along with my students, not just sort of something that I teach my students, is building the consciousness about our own migrant backgrounds. And so to think about refugees in or migrants in Wisconsin, um, perhaps is an opportunity for all of us to think about um, whether somebody started a journey somewhere under duress or willfully and then ended up here. Um, you see the long history of migrations of not just Germans here, the history of, of um, um, the Jewish migration into uh, the United States, starting with, you know, late to early, uh, late 19th, early 20th centuries, all the way, you know, holo during the Holocaust and afterwards. I mean, that is a very important part of history. Why shouldn't that not be relevant today, remembering that historical framework? And I think that for me is, is being in touch with that history, with the past and trying to look towards the future, that makes it extremely relevant to think about this. So my, Ideas on the film notwithstanding, my dissatisfaction, I think it's an important film because it at least gives you the opportunity to think about these issues. Yeah, and I think one thing, important thing in relation to Wisconsin is that, yeah, so, so not, not me, I'm not an immigration or, or um, expert on migration, but these are experts up here and the investment that the Netherlands made while it seems shockingly high, um, making a film, film production, uh, development, travel, budgets, getting into film festivals is a costly endeavor, but the power of media to, um, of a well-made, you know, even provocative or maybe, you know, problematic media to be made and to get people to think about that, to get them to be more conscious of um, what migration is like or what the conversation about migration in Europe is like, I think might make it worth it. Um, in relation to Wisconsin specifically, um, the Wisconsin Film Office, which might have supported programs to bring attention to the history of migrants to Wisconsin um, or to the Midwest, um, has been closed for three years or so for maybe four years since deep budget cuts to the state. So it's, it's um, offices like that, it's offices like the NEH and the NEA, um, state councils on arts that help prog you know, programs like this be made. Um, you know, this is made for television in Europe, which has a much more robust um, support of the arts, no matter what, you know, whether they're not completely satisfactory or what, but it's, it's having a breadth of, um, you know, breadth of perspectives, exactly, that can help us understand better and, you know. So that's, maybe that's my defense of it, even if it, I agree, it's not completely satisfactory. <laughs> All right, unfortunately we are out of time, but I just want to thank our panelists here for their really insightful comments. And the audience, you asked some great questions that for the most part, the panelists tended to answer just as the paper reached my hands. It was like magic. Um, I've been told that the upstairs is open if you'd like to continue the conversation. Um, but otherwise, thank you again for attending. And I hope that if nothing else, this documentary has raised a lot of questions for you. Thank you. Uh, refugee.